Charles Martin, founder of Calculation Consulting, a boutique consultancy, which uh, we will talk about later on in this podcast. Uh, welcome to the Day to Day Exchange uh, podcast. Hey, great. Thanks for having me. And um, Charles and I have a mutual fan, friend, the legendary Michael Mahoney. <laughs> Mike's a great guy, super sharp. Uh, and we want to give him a shout out here at the top of this episode. So uh, there's two main topics I wanted to have Charles on for, and both will be of interest to machine learning engineers and data scientists who use deep learning. So the first one is this new paper that uh, Charles, Mike, and another colleague, Serena, uh, put out called uh, Predicting Trends in the Quality of State-of-the-Art Neural Networks without access to training or testing data. So first question. So uh, Charles, the classic way of evaluating a ML model is just to do a split, right? So, or some kind of a holdout set where you uh, train a model and see if it's effective. So why is this not enough? Well, the, the classic application is uh, quantitative finance. So I used to be a quant on Wall Street and, you know, we designed models to predict the markets. And if you peek at the market data, you'll overtrain. So in, in quantitative finance, you're trying to do portfolio analysis. You're trying to do um, prediction of alpha, which are predicting the markets. You need to be able to evaluate whether your, your models are good or not without really overfitting to the historical data or trying to peek forward in any way. So this is sort of the motivation and a lot of the theory that is used in Weight Watcher actually comes from quantitative finance. So, uh, so in in a in a practical sense, right? So, uh, so by the way, I was also a quant. That was actually my first job out of. Academia. Oh wow! Okay, my first job out of academia. Surprisingly hard field. I mean, uh, in, terms great, of, great, in terms of stuff. in terms of uh, being able to do something consistently that makes money. <laughs> Yeah, well, you know, I was at BGI, which is Barclays, which you yeah. know, one time was the largest hedge fund in the world. And, you know, yeah. the market turned yeah. and they didn't. So they got acquired right. by BlackRock. Um, yeah. It's even if you're doing everything right, the market can turn on you. Right, 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 right. So in, in, uh, so a couple of quick questions. First, why, why did you uh, folks choose to focus on neural networks? Well, you know, deep learning is sort of a hot space. I did my... Um, my postdoctoral work in the statistical mechanics of neural networks. So this is back in the 90s when, you know, this was all theoretical physics. So I've always had an interest in this. Uh, my, you know, my research group at Chicago um, developed something which you know as AlphaFold. That was actually done by my, my research advisor. In fact, this project actually came, I used to go in. Uh, so what happened was the Google Mind guys, uh, Google, Google DeepMind, they hired John Jumper, who was the student from Chicago who was working on this. And so the way this got started was I was talking one day to Michael. This was several years ago, I think at MLConf. And we were just sitting around talking coffee. And I said, you know, when you look at these neural networks, they, um, they look like protein folding. The, the way they behave, they, they should, you know, it looks like they're basically behaving the way uh, th that the energy landscape should behave as if it's, it's funneled like a funnel. And there was this paper that came out by Lee Kun, which said, no, no, the, the, this things look like spin glasses and the energy landscape is, is degenerate. And my advisor had worked for Edwards who won the Nobel prize for development of, of things like spin glasses. And I was, and he goes, this stuff's all nonsense. You know, this is totally wrong. So, and we were talking about some of the work that they were doing early on, on Google, on this deep mind alpha fold stuff. And I said, you know, I bet I could apply some of this protein folding stuff to understand why neural networks work. And, and Mike sort of convinced me to come give a talk at UC Berkeley on it. I did this in like 2015 and I gave sort of the first talk on the project and we just started talking and we would talk for a couple hours every week about the theory. And eventually it just sort of, you know, the, the idea sort of crystallized after about two years of just really talking, you know, every week about it and really thinking about different theoretical ideas. But then uh, uh, as, uh, when you guys wrote the paper, you made a point of making sure that uh, uh, 
kind of uh, the people who work in industry uh, realize that there's some actual practical implications of this work, right? So, um, so in your oh, absolutely. mind, absolutely, absolutely. So, so in your mind, so what are some of the practical takeaways or concrete steps that people in industry can take from this work? So the first thing you can do with it is you can, we've been using it as an early stopping criteria. So that was sort of the first goals. We've had a couple of people do this. We have a hedge fund trying this, where you look at the alpha metric and you watch if the alpha metric drops below two. And when the alpha metrics drop below two, this is an indication that your models may be overfit and can be used as an early stopping criteria. So where did, where did this threshold come from? The threshold comes from random matrix theory. Okay. So if, if we have a paper that's coming out, uh, I think it's coming out in JMLR, Journal of Machine Learning Research, where we talk about the idea that um, there are these different universality classes of random matrix theory. And when you win in the, in the alpha, and they're characterized by alpha. And this, again, these are ideas that come from theoretical physics and finance. So there are some people who do random matrix theory for neural networks, but they're not doing it this way. So th this, the way we do it is there, there's, there are different universality classes. And what happens basically when alpha is less than two, the practical side is basically, look, um, you're, you're, you're basically sampling from a, a network, which is atypical. So when you have an A, and this is very well known in finance, there's a guy named uh, Talib who talks a lot about what happens when you have heavy tail distributions. But what happens is basically your weight matrices become atypical when alpha is less than two. You have a parallel distribution. The, the mean is no longer well-defined. Um, and when you sample from the weight matrix, you're sampling from something which is overtrained. So That's bad. So... Um... So the uh, so you you cite an example from finance, right? So I yes. imagine since deep learning is widely used in other areas like computer vision, natural language, and speech, uh, you can do the same thing for models in those areas. But uh, yeah, but absolutely. Yeah, 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 yeah. But your your paper makes a point of of highlighting the fact that. Uh, what you're doing is you're doing this evaluation without access to the model or the training. Or well, the I, I, see, when we started this, yeah. um, I was thinking about how can I actually have impact in the field yeah. when I have no, I mean, I'm doing this basically on my own. I have no right. funding. I don't have right. any resources. Serena was an intern who came to work with us. She was fantastic. And right. she, her background is in quantitative finance. Right. So, um, so I, I thought, how can we actually make progress? And I thought, you know, there are all these pre-trained models. Why don't we just look at the pre-trained models? I don't need access to uh, ImageNet data set. I don't need to train anything. I'll bet we could actually look at a pre-trained model and tell whether it's overtrained or not without looking at the data. So this is actually uh, of interest to me because I've been doing more uh, uh, practical work in NLP. And as you know, in NLP, there's so many of these embeddings. Yes, yes. And, and, and things like that. So then when you go to like, a, okay, so now I, I have a task, I'm going to choose an embedding, but there's like over 100 embeddings. Yes. And then, and then you start reading, uh, maybe you can narrow down to 10 based on your reading of, of, yes, yes. of, of uh, what people have done, but uh, there's no way for you to, in a principled way, kind of uh, make select selection. The, yeah. Right. How do you select a model to fine tune? And so that's absolutely correct. And, and, you know, this is sort of the ideas by looking at the alpha metric on different kinds of models. Can you determine whether a pre-trained model is going to be good for you to find, to fine tune? Can you tell whether your fine tune is working? We, we had a client I worked with a few years ago prior to GPT-3, you know, this the GPT mm -hmm. models from OpenAI. And we built a model for them to generate fake text. And, and um, how do we evaluate? What are you going to do? You're going to hire someone and, right, and, right, and evaluate right, the text. It's very expensive. So what if we had ways of a, how do you evaluate these NLP models without having to do some sort of very expensive brute force evaluation? Because it's not the same like a, in a classifier, you have the classification accuracy. But if you're generating fake text, you have to read the text. So we thought, you know, there, you know, there are many cases in industry or, or, where- or, or Charles, in, uh, in most cases in ML, obviously. So in this particular case of language and language embeddings, uh, they all have some good performance and some benchmark, but there's also a lot of benchmarks. 
Yeah. What benchmark do you use? Yeah. And, and that's right. And there's a lot of controversy over you look at BERT. And right now I'm, we're looking at, a, a you know, can we use this techniques to analyze fine tuning of BERT? And what you find is actually there are all these different metrics for BERT. And you find that fine tuning it is unstable. And when you do different things, you know, you, you get all sorts of different results. It's total. And we don't know, like, is there a robust estimator? And it's very difficult to figure out what's going on. And, and that, you know, in my, you know, I work in industry. So yeah. this happens all the time. And the other thing is that people will give you a model. I don't have access to it. I don't know who trained it. I give the model to somebody else. They, they send it off to the production team. They put it into the production deployment system, their ML ops system. The, the, you know, if we, you know, the, it, you know things get handed off. Um, and so in the real world, you know, there's not just one person working on something. There are lots of models, lots of choices. So we're hoping that this can be used as a quality metric. So you, you, you could be, so this class of tools and techniques could be part of kind of the QA model validation. Yes. Before you deploy. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Sort of like a consumer products seal of approval. We have an example of, uh, you know, imagine going into a client and you want to tell the client, hey, look, I've built this pre-trained model. I'd like you to use it. And the client doesn't want to spend $10,000 or $50,000 to evaluate it. So it'd be nice to tell the client when you're doing a sale, hey, look, we've run it through the Weight Watcher tool and we have these quality metrics and, you know, our alphas are all between two and four. And we don't have any layers that are um, that are anomalous, and we don't have any large alphas, no small alphas, no weird spikes. So we're pretty confident this thing's going to work for you. And so I think it, that would be like a good, um, very very practical use. Of so something like this. so so you 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 kind of uh, cited the example of Bert. So what are other examples of uh, where you folks applied these techniques and you uh, found out something surprising or interesting? So another interesting thing is when you look at some of the pre-trained models, like the VGG models, and also some of the NLP models, every once in a while, you'll see layers that have unusually large spikes in them. I call them correlation traps. And we kind of allude to this in the Nature paper, but we have some other papers where we're, you know, and we have a paper we submitted to NIPS. We haven't fully flushed this all out yet, but it is on my blog. And the idea is that, look, when you apply... You know, normally you think about, oh, I'm going to trade a neural network. Think about old school ML. You would apply an L2 regularizer. And yet, if you look at the weight matrices, the Weight Watcher will, tool will do this for you. It will analyze the layers of your neural network, and it will detect times, cases of layers where it appears that the regularization failed. And you have these unusually large elements in W. And that's kind of a, a signal that we think maybe something wrong with the model. And we can apply a sharpness transform to kind of, basically you clip them, right? People would clip the elements and then retrain. And so using random matrix theory, you can actually clip the elements more efficiently. And, and so the way we have, I'm, I'm, it's, the Weight Watcher tool kind of shows you this. And I'm going to eventually, you know, in the next few weeks, have this feature where you give it a model. It will analyze the layers. It will try to detect these strange correlation traps, which are basically, when did L2 regularization fail on the layer? And then it will it will optimally clip the W elements so that you can do a little more fine tuning. You won't have any weird problems. So it's a, it's a type of, of a different kind of regularizer that we've developed. So as you as you noted uh, in, in the real world, um, ML can involve multiple teams, right? So there's handoffs. Uh, oh yeah. There, oh, there's yeah. different level of expertise. So in your dream scenario, in your ideal scenario how usable, how accessible would some of these techniques be? Because right now, when, as you explain it, it comes across still as somewhat requiring some expertise. So, right. so, so do, you, do, you, do you envision a, a day where uh, you just have some kind of UI? And uh, Yes. So one, one thing we'd like, we think about is like a SaaS service where uh, similar to like the weights and bias service where you could upload the model and then we'll kind of clean it up for you and give you some quality metrics. And, you know, you give us some Bitcoin or something like that. And um, that's something we'd like to put together. Obviously, that requires funding, you know. And so my main goal right now is to try to see, is this a good product for people? Is this something useful? It's an open source tool. We have a Slack channel. 
if people want to use the tool, I will help you. You know, I'll work with you on the Slack channel to make sure the tool is good. I mean, this is still pre-alpha, Thanks. right? I've been writing this. So I, I, one of my staff guys and I had an intern help me on it. But, you know, we're trying to make the tool as low friction as possible. So, talk, so, I, so know, let, let's talk through how it would fit in a normal ML workflow, right? So, so, uh, so I, 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 I train a model and then what? Well, so like, for example, with the, um, with, you could use it as a plugin to TensorBoard or Weights and Bias where it would have a monitoring aspect. So you could look at the alpha. You can also look at something called um, the smooth training loss so we actually if you have training data so let's say you're training so let's break up people training models deploying models so if you're training a model we actually if you use the training data we can actually tell you what we think the test accuracy is going to be by evaluating a smooth version of the model on the training error so we can give you a smooth training error which actually will tell you, for example, if you're, if you're overfitting. In other words, are you, you know, it can use as an early stopping criteria during training and um, as opposed to doing cross, or in addition to doing cross-validation. So Charles, so, so, so for the people who are not uh, uh, super familiar with kind of the intricacies of, of, of uh, your folks' methodology or Weight Watcher. Okay, um, okay. What kind of, so what's this, you know, the mindset has to change a little bit, right? Because basically, basically you go from just a simple, I build a model, test it. And, and so now it's slightly different. There's an, a level of, of QA and qualitative checking. Well, look, I, I, I think a lot of people, when you're trying to build a model and you're testing it, you, you get to a point where you're looking at specific examples and you're trying to understand, okay, how do I get this thing to really operate at high accuracy? And you have to go in and do things like, can I fine tune specific layers? So, you know, so in other words, so one, go thing, ahead. so one thing that people are have been doing is, uh, and I don't know how, if this fits with uh, your folks' program, is uh, data augmentation kind of things where ah ah here here's a here's a good example. Okay, okay. so another thing you can do with the model. One of the probably one of the biggest questions we, people have in, in industry is, do I have enough data? Right? Do I have enough data? I, I'm in a self-driving car company, or I have a friend who runs a translational or, or, medicine. Is my, is my data representative of what it will see in production? Yes. Yeah, so there are two two things you can do. So one, you can use the alpha quality metric to determine whether you need more data. So we saw this, for example, with GPT versus GPT two. As you add more data, the alphas will get smaller. And so you can tell immediately, do I have enough data or don't I? And, and so you know if I add more data, you know, do I need more data or am I good? That's can good. I, can I mean, I... that's a good, good, very practical signal, right? Yes, that's one, yes, An absolutely. Another thing, you can do, another thing you can do is let's say we have a very, very small model and you don't have a lot of data. We can actually tell you the minimum amount of the, the minimum amount of data you need. So we because we can use the Weight Watchers tool as an early stopping metric, you could take a model which has you can train a model with a minimal amount of data, and then you predict the test accuracy. And as long as the test accuracy keeps going down, you're okay. But as soon as the test accuracy starts going up, you know, as a function of epoch. You know, you start training in the test. Now, you know, you've overfit. So you can actually tell whether you have enough data. And for small models, we have now where you can actually tell what is the minimum amount of data I need to get something useful without overfitting. So, so Charles, uh, um, so we're not, so our conversation is mostly focused on accuracy, right? Yes. So nowadays, of course, people are starting to say, well, there's more to ML than accuracy, there's other risks like fairness, security, privacy, reliability, and safety. So is, is, is this sort of, is this set of approaches and tools, could you also kind of broaden the criteria? Yes, yeah, so we, we think, in turn, we discussed this in the Nature paper. One of the examples we looked at is some of the compression models that are being used at Intel. 
And we, we actually spoke to the CTO of Intel about this, and we looked at some of their models. And what we found is that, you know, one of so the things- So wait, wait, wait. Wanted, so what, what are the compression models? So <laughs> what happens is someone has a model, they build a big model, but they want to run it on some, you know, smaller hardware. Right. So you have to compress the model. You got to get it down. So you either have to compress the model using some model compression algorithm or a distillation algorithm, or you got to retrain, you got to rebuild a smaller model, right? So, which, so uh, which, are, of, which our friend Mike Mahoney also has a bunch of things. Yeah, yeah. He has a lot of work on <laughs> quantization. That's right. Hessian based quantization. That's right. Uh, probably a very practical stuff. But look, I, or if you're doing like NLP and you're trying to run inference with BERT or GPT, you, you, inference has an SLA on it. You know, you've got to be able to get the thing to do it. You know, I work in search relevance. We have an SLA of 100 milliseconds. You know, one of my pet peeves in NLP is, uh, is uh, you know, you've got all these models and yeah, they trained in a large corpus, but they're not tuned for your domain. Right. 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 So, so for example, classic, classic uh, NLP task is named entity recognition. Yes. I mean, so they all have, I mean, all these uh, models have an NER out of the box, but they're trained on newspaper. <laughs> Or, yeah. or whatever, right? So they don't really apply it to whatever domain you have. No, and no. And, have, you'd, and then none of these tools really explain how you tune them. Yeah, yeah you'd like to tune them. Yeah. But how do you measure the, how do you tune them and measure the quality? Absolutely. It's, 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 it's the problems we're working on now. It's it's same in search relevance. All these people want to use neural embeddings to do search relevance. But you you just can't take a neural embedding right off the shelf like Bert and use it for search relevance. You have to, you have to tune it to the click stream. Right. And it has right. to represent the engagement. You know, you have yeah, to, right. it has to show popular items have to come up first. Right. So this is tricky. And, and how do you know whether your tuning is working? So this so anyway, is anyway, I, I derailed you. So fairness. So. No, no, absolutely. So look, this is a good point. So we have, we believe that you can detect if you do something to a model. So if you try to compress it or you distill it, or you try to fine tune it, um, you might break it in some way that is difficult to detect just by looking at the test accuracy. And so by exam, so you can, for us, we can examine the model layer by layer and look to see, do the layers behave properly? So one of the things we look at is, do you have, you know, are there layers with unusually large alphas? If you see a layer with an unusually large alpha, that might tell you that the layer has been over-parameterized and is not converging properly. If you have a layer with an unusually small alpha, less than two, maybe 1.5 or 1.6, that might tell you that the layer is overtrained. And so in our nature paper, we give an example of this, we call it correlation flow. And we look at how the layer alphas change in, uh, in different models like VGG versus ResNet versus DenseNet. And we point out that if you have as you as you have a model like VGG, the, the old school models, the the layers that are closer to the data tend to have smaller alphas, and the layers that are closer to the labels tend to have larger alphas. And it seems like the the systematically a model like VGG, the correlation doesn't flow smoothly. So you have this problem that the earlier layers might be overtrained, and the later layers might be undertrained. So, and so we can detect this. So how do you, so, but still, how do you, how do you use? How do you fix these, it? How, no, how do you use these approaches to, to optimize more than accuracy? So, so one of the things you would want to do is, I discussed this idea, you can go in and you can apply this, this sharpness transform, this SVD sharpness, where you can clip out large elements of W. In other words, it's like a regularizer. You regu you fix some of the layers that are broken. So that's one thing you can do. Another thing you can do is you can use, you can monitor the alphas and you can try to adjust the layer learning rates. So if you but, see but, that there uh, are layers. But since you, you're kind of data agnostic, data, training data agnostic. The, you, okay, so you may you have- you, you may miss that the training data is not good. If you have training data, so there are things you can do there as well. So for example, if you have training data, you can, predict, you can predict the test accuracy without having to look at the test data. So you can see cases where 
if the test, if you're predicted oh, test by the accuracy. Way, uh, by the way, what you just mentioned there, you can predict the test accuracy without. Without test uh, data. Without test data. So how, uh, how, uh, how good is that prediction? Well, we're, we're trying to get it better. We're, we track it very well. It's not 100% yet, but we're working on trying to get a very accurate. You know, we'd like to get it as accurate as doing cross-validation. By the way, I, I, uh, I, I failed in my uh, duties as a host because I, okay. uh, I, forgot to, I forgot to ask you very early on to clarify at a very kind of much more uh, high level or, or, or for our industry audience, this notion of alpha. Uh, okay, so it's very simple. Alpha is a what Weight Watcher does is it measures the amount of correlation that each layer in your neural network has learned. So the point of a neural network is to learn correlations in the data. Uh, so alpha is a measure of the amount of correlation. And the smaller the alpha metric is, the better core, the more correlation your layer learned. And if the alpha, so if the alpha is large, you didn't learn much correlation. So it's sort of, it's sort of like Goldilocks, right? You know. Uh, you know, the bed is too soft, the bed is too hard. So if the bed is too soft, alpha is too large, you really didn't learn enough about your data. So your model is undertrained. That layer is undertrained. If alpha is too small, oh, the bed's too hard, right? You've, you've overtrained that layer. And, and if and, alpha is... And, and you, folks can, you, you folks can discern what this alpha is just by looking at the model. Wait. Yes, the tool will, the Weight Watcher tool will compute the alpha metric layer by layer, and it will tell you which layer is overtrained, which layers are overtrained, which layers are undertrained, and which layers are just right. And then you can use it as a monitoring tool to try to adjust different layers so that you have a balanced model. So, uh, and also, Probably uh, this tool will give you an indication of how robust this model is, right? Yes, yes. So another thing you can do is try to, you can look for problems which would indicate that the model is somewhat brittle. So you can look layer by layer and yeah, you can you, see you, case you, you, used to, you used the phrase uh, overfitted earlier. Yes, you can look for layers that are overfit which would make the model brittle, less robust. You can also see, you can identify layers where the regularization did not work properly. So that is, in other words, you have unusually large elements that shouldn't be there. What about, so you uh, can, Ch Charles, the notion of uh, a model that really just over-memorized? Yes. So we also have um, a metric you can add. I, I This metric, is, there's some stuff that's in the core tool and some that are, I'm still coding up, but we use something called a, CC, a CKA metric. So you can compare, um, as you're training, you can compare one epoch to the next. In other words, you compare, how does the model vary on each epoch? And you can see whether the, as your model is learning, you want to avoid memorizing the data. So for example, you can use the tool to study whether imagine taking the model and randomizing it. You know, you train it twice on different random initializations. Those two initializations should, you know, you, you, they shouldn't, the, the models that you get at the end should not be terribly different. And if they are very different, then that suggests that you're memorizing something instead of really um, learning. So you can use the tool to detect when you're when you're over memorizing the data. So that, that's um, it's so, a little more technical, but we can do that as well. So it seems like Charles, this tool it will be easy to, for a non-expert to use if you just have the if you have a UX where it kind of just scores uh, layers or scores models and then gives an indication. Hey, you're in the red zone. Or you're in the green zone. Yes, you know I'm terrible at UI. I used to be a swing programmer in Java. No, no, no. But, but, I'm, I'm but what I'm what but I'm saying. Yes, that's the idea. Yes. What I'm saying is, it's uh, it's really uh, it can uh, really benefit an industry. Uh, I, I, you user, know, right? I, I, I think so. The big question we have, because you know, we'd like to raise some. You know, we right now the way the tool works is, you give it a model, it gives you a data frame. And you, and you do the plots in the data frame yourself. 
if this tool turns out to be useful for people, uh, I, we'd like to turn to a product where we put a, you know, you put a web interface on it and that's exactly what we do. And so we're, um, I'm, I'm not a great web programmer, so I cannot build it myself, but that's essentially the idea. And, and what we'd really like to know is whether the tool is useful to you and whether you feel comfortable uploading your model to a SaaS service. By the way, there's, there's two, there's two, um, there's two ways you can use this tool. Uh, one is, uh, yeah, you build the model, you use the tool to evaluate, to evaluate the quality of your model. The other, the other way you can use it is, uh, actually, uh, you, you folks described this in your paper, uh, kind of as a meta-analysis tool for, hey, I'm actually, I want to, I want to do something in NLP. Here's a bunch of embeddings or models. I want to pick among the best. Yes. So or at least paper... narrowed narrow down to a list of five or six, right? Yes. Yeah. So the paper is really um, a way of using a way of using a tool to do meta analysis on hundreds of models. So, for example, one of the projects we're working on now is we want to take well, all the, the what's the computation time, Charles? So, so, so what is the what's the largest in terms of parameters of mo that you folks? Have well, I mean, we, we've been running it on on the open AI, on the open AI GPT models. So, I mean, it can run on with models with hundreds and hundreds of layers. I mean, it takes a few minutes per model. So the, just the few, paper just, just a few minutes. That I mean, I would take that, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's meant to be fast. I mean, I can dream up crazy stuff, but you know, um, look. No, no. But paper... I mean, uh, it's it, you know, because these models take months and months to train, and then now you're giving me a tool where I have a bunch of big models. I can kind of narrow down to my top two. Yeah, no. The the idea of the model is that you can run on every epoch, so it's it's meant to it's meant to be run on very large systems. So if you're training something like Bert. You can run the tool at the end of every epoch. It's meant to be fast enough for that. You know, we were assuming that each epoch might take an hour or 20 minutes to train. You know, if your epochs are taking 10 seconds to train, the tool is going to be very slow. The meta analysis we did with Serena, that took several days on Google Colab. So we analyzed 500 models and all the computer vision models we could find. We eventually boiled it down to like 180 because we had to throw some of them out. They weren't good models. But it took several days on Google Colab. Um, but that it's designed to be run in, on something like Google Colab, which doesn't require huge amounts of memory. It's not, um, the tool doesn't require a GPU. So it's not, it doesn't, you know, so you don't have to pay for a GPU to use it. It's meant to run on, you know, it is a little memory intensive, but um, not, not terribly. But yeah, it's, it's you know, and if, and if we wanted to run on a GPU, I'm sure we could speed it up. You know, it's, it's just uses the underlying blast. SVD scikit learn libraries. So it's it's very fast. And you certainly, you know, if you want to run a hundred models through it, you know, it might take half a day, you know, to do that, uh, depending on how, you know, a hundred very, very large NLP models. But you know, it's not weeks and weeks of work. It's it's meant to be um, it's meant to be something operational you can run on your laptop or on Google Colab in real time, in semi real time. So one of the things that we, we talked repeatedly about, which is a, a real problem in industry, is uh, fine-tuning models. Yes. So so how does so this tool will tell you exactly what in terms of fine-tuning a model? Well, the I, there there are a couple of things you can do. First, you you want to pick a model. You know, it allows you to to look through various kinds of models, which ones you want to fine-tune, and you can determine. You know, you want to you, you you don't want to have a model which has um, you know a, a huge number of large alphas that might take a large time to fine tune, but you, you can pick different models like GPT. Like in the paper, we discuss GPT versus GPT two, and we show that you know the GPT two model, uh, which is this NLP model from OpenAI, it's exactly the same as the GPT model, but when you add more data, the alphas get smaller. So you can see that when you fine tune. The idea is that as you're fine tuning, it's you know you, you usually you fine tune on very small data sets. Right, so right. You, that, you, that's you, the you, that's the point. Right. You, you already have a good model. You just want to tweak uh, tune it, right? Right. So there there are two things you can do. Two things. One, if you're trying to do like a big change when you're fine tuning, if you if you have a big data set and you're trying to fine tune, then you can monitor the alphas and watch them go down. If you have a small data set and you're trying to fine tune. Then you can monitor the smooth, what we call 
the smoothed training error because you have data. So you, you evaluate, you, 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 you apply our Weight Watcher SVD smoothing method and you evaluate the training error on your fine tuned data. And that will give you a much better idea of, and that, that training error should go down, right? And if that training error starts to go up, that means you're, you're overfitting. I see, I see. So it allows you to, and you know, I mean, what's the problem with fine tuning, right? When do you stop? How long do you fine tune for? And how much data do you need? Those are the two big questions. So, so we, the tool is designed to help you answer those two questions. So here's a, here's might be a, a an odd question, but it might it it probably is a, an actual industry concern, which is basically, as you mentioned, uh, uh, what if I want to use your tool? Let's say you set up a SaaS, right? I want right. to use your uh, tool to evaluate my model, but I actually don't want to share my model with you. That, there, well, I mean, is, you is know, there look, way, I, is there a way for me to disguise my model? You know, that's a good that's a good question. Uh, look, I, 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 this is a debate I've been having with a friend of mine. We think about raising some funding for this. Look, yeah. we have an open source tool and you can use the open source tool. You can hire me as a consultant. You know, I, I do work for a living. Uh, I, I'm not, a, I'm not independently wealthy. So I'm happy to come into your company, sign an NDA and do the analysis for you. But, uh, but um, supposedly the SaaS will have the, the UX. Yeah. I mean, if you build a SaaS, I mean, obviously you have to upload the model to run it. So right. Yeah, I mean, the other alternative would well, be to try I, to. I, I, I was hoping you would say you would answer. Oh yeah, there's all this research now on privacy preserving. Yeah, I mean, you, you, there <laughs> is. I mean, I, I, you know, do I do I want to make? No, no, but um, none, none, none of those none of those tools re, none of those approaches really disguise the underlying. No, model. I mean, Weight Watcher is not a homomorphic operation. Yeah. If that's what you're asking. Yeah, no, I mean, I basically, you know, look, if we did something like this, you would have to be like with. I mean, look at like how weights and biases work. Or, or right, you, you know, you can still it's it'll still be useful because honestly, the uh, even people in industry look at all these models that be are being re released by researchers yeah. right and left. So they, you know, they they might be curious as to which ones to pursue further, and then and then they tweak it, right? So they can upload kind of public models even to the service, right? Yeah, I mean, in the old days, you know, you would just write an application and sell it to somebody, and they'd get a key. But, you know, uh, right, that's, I'm an old guy. That's how we did things. But do it as a SaaS model. Yeah, you'd have to upload it there. You know, we'd have to figure out a way to, you know, you know, we'd have to sandbox it in a way so people can't get into it. You know, you obviously upload it to an AWS bucket or something like this in some sandboxed way. But I, I mean, I think that that's I mean, it is a concern. Look, like in finance, people certainly don't want to do that. Right. right so exactly. we have the tool. And of course, we're happy to come in as a consulting service and, you know, help you run the tool. I mean, there, there are limits to, you know, if someone wants to buy the tool and make a piece of software internally, you can do that too. I mean, just, you know, it, you know the point is, of course, you're not going to get the updates. So, I mean, that, that's a trade-off. I mean, it's, it's a problem with, with AI in general. So that, here's, you know, here, here's but, another uh, uh, kind of uh, left field question, which is basically, you know, I mean, certainly in, in many areas, vision, speech, NLP, yeah, deep learning, no problem. But let's say you're in tabular data where there's some still some debate. Uh, can you foresee a scenario where uh, this approach would also help me evaluate non-neural network architectures? So that's a good question. So that I can um, compare, oh, for my domain, maybe I should be using XGBoost or some related model instead of yes. one yeah. So it, it's a good question. And I, we've had some people in, in medical community ask us this. I, I think any model, the answer is I think so. We have an example, I have an example on my blog, Calculated Content, where I describe how to apply this to vanilla latent semantic analysis. So that's not a neural network, but you know, you basically, you're learning and embedding. So, uh, you know, you have a matrix, you run SVD, and we show that the theory works um, even when you're doing simple SVD, I mean, because the theory is something that um, is from physics. We've known from physics you can do this. It's just not known, well known in, in statistics. Uh, so, yes, I, I think if you could find a way to extract out, you know, the parameters from an XGBoost model, put them into a vector, reshape them into a matrix and run this, you would probably see something. And it's just time for me to do that. And I, I think 
I think in principle we could do it. The tool doesn't do it yet, but in, in principle, you might be able to look at an XG boost model and tell whether it's overfit. I mean, that would be sort of what you'd want to do. That's the problem with XG boost is that, you know, it can overfit. Um, you know, it's got all these adjustable parameters, right? And you never know whether you're overfit. And certainly, um, uh, if you're trying to do anything that's time series related or anything that's, you know, predicted these kind of predictions, it's problematic. So that is uh, an area we'd like to explore. It's just, you know, it's just me coding this. So I have to find the time to do that. But I think it's, it's theoretically, it should be completely possible. So how much education do you, Mike and your crew still have to do in terms of, let's say, just uh, forget about uh, industry for now, but even within the ML community, is this is the is what you folks doing? Kind of, uh, uh, what's the reaction to this? Well, I, you know, we've been at this for several years, yeah. and Mike is very good. You know, Mike's very famous, you know, so he's very good at at, at um, explaining it to people. Like, I think that th we're starting to see some traction. One of the things I need to do is finish writing up a paper into physics, like you know, the, the derivation of why this works actually takes ideas from quantum field theory and statistical mechanics. So I have to, I have a blog post where I describe all this. I have to sit down and write a physics paper that explains here's why this works. There was a so there's, massive... there, there, there's two audiences then. So there's the audience for the paper, which might be more of the theoretical computer scientists yes. who are working on deep learning. But then there's the empirical ML community. Well, you know, uh, the, it's difficult to get papers published if you don't have a theory. Right, right, right. So we submit, like we submitted the, the nature paper to NIPS, NIRPS. They're like, oh, this is just empirical. Like, well, yeah, you yeah, know. The whole, field, the, the whole field is empirical. Of course, you know. <laughs> and, and we get like some of the reviews we get back are just ridiculous. Like, oh, you can't apply random matrix theory to discrete systems. And I'm like, it was invented for discrete systems. It was invented by Figner for the study of nuclear spectra. So, you know, we re we submitted the paper to Nature. They're like, this is fantastic. So I, I think the ML community is a little um, insular when you try to publish. If you try to publish in NIPS or you try to go to ICML. Uh, I see. If you, so, what, if you so, don't so the sequence of events is you have to publish in some mainstream ML conference well, in, order, I, I, in order for the broader ml practitioner community to well what what i'm finding is that if i don't have publications and i go into clients they they don't believe me that i know how to do stuff so they're like well you know like guys i mean you know so we publish this stuff to try to explain to people what's going on but th there is i i think the because that's what people want to see now look 10 years ago if you publish something, people would say you're an academic and you couldn't get you couldn't get hired. What so about today, uh, what about uh, Charles? What what if you folks evangelize within the theoretical computer science community that that is trying to understand uh, deep learning? Well, I mean, this is stuff that Mike is going out doing because he has you know he's a faculty member at Berkeley and so he has funding to do this. Um, we have my approach to this has been. I, I work with the Page family. So I, I do consulting work in, in physics for them in nuclear physics and quantum computing. So I, I focus more on the physics aspects of it. I think that for me, the most important thing is to build a tool that people can use. You build a tool, you give them the tool, you ask them to use the tool. Guys, try to remember this is a pre-alpha tool. It, I'm writing it. I'm, I would love to have someone like Serena who, is an, who actually worked on the tool with us and is an open source contributor. We'd love to turn into an open source tool that people can use. Um, that requires, you know, community. Uh, but my approach to getting this to people using an industry is just give it to them. Talk to me about what your problems are. If you need me to come in, I can come in and talk to you, you know, under, you know, as a, as a consulting project, or we could just do it open source and you use it. And, and the goal is to make the tool as low friction as possible. Um, obviously, we have to write more documentation on and, it. We and, have to write more and, papers uh, to explain it. And, and for the tool to, within, we, within very short order, prove utility, right? Right, no, right. to me, it has, there's an old saying by Carver Mead, who's a very famous um, you know, guy, uh, uh, electrical engineer from Caltech. Every theory that's useful, every measurement you make that is useful ends up becoming a tool. So this is, to me, it's kind of like, this is an oscilloscope for deep learning. And my main goal is to 
make sure that, you know, for me, look, I, I did my background in theoretical chemistry. Right. So the group I worked at, you know, they developed uh, AlphaFold. You know, th that was the early stages of AlphaFold. That's theoretical work. That's very practical. Um, in quantum chemistry, you write quantum chemistry software. You solve the Schrodinger equation. Uh, you, know, you do the hardest math you can imagine, but then you make a tool and you give it to people. John Popel won the Nobel Prize for the development of the Gaussian software system. Martin Karplus won the Nobel Prize for the development of Charm. Um, I'm sure the guys at Google DeepMind will win the Nobel Prize for AlphaFold. So to me, the, in, I come from a field where you have to give people tools and, they and you have to give it to people in the industry and they have to be able to use it. That to me is what theory is. Theory in physics, theory is something you give to people to use. It, it's not something you write. It's not just about writing papers. And so for me, it's very important to design a theory that can solve practical problems in industry. And, and so we have sort of, we have to clean up the theory a bit. Um, so, but a lot of theory people don't do that. They just do theory, right? Like, here's the, like, look at VC theory. How do you use it? That's the first thing I saw VC, you know, VC, how do you use VC theory? You can't use it. it. It doesn't really work. And if you go back and you look at some of the old papers by Vapnik and Lee Kun, they're like, no, this stuff doesn't work. I mean, this has been known for a long time. So for me, theory is something that you give to a practitioner and they use it. Obviously it's complicated. So you, you, you ask me, look, we're trying to use this tool. We tried it. We got these goofy results. What does this mean? And I go, okay, well, let me try to fix the tool up and add a feature. So a lot of this, I see a lot of the questions as like feature requests, you know, like, like, like one thing we recently figured out how to apply, like one of the open questions we've had for some time is how do you apply the tool to an LSTM layer? So I think we finally figured this out. I guess it took some time, right? But why is it working with But uh, I guess uh, to sum up our conversation, if if you yes. if you give this set of approaches and tools a chance, you'll end up with a machine learning group that will probably release models that are more robust. Uh, yes, more robust, less likely to fail. Um, yeah, more robust, right? More robust, more accurate. More accurate, more robust. And and and, and, and uh, uh, it's also a way for you to evaluate uh, other models in a principled way, rather than just kind of because right now uh, people, what people like me and you probably do is okay. So we need to do something. Let's read papers. <laughs> let me let me uh, yeah absolutely right. Well, let me tell you what the CTO of Intel said to me when I started working on this. I got to put this stuff in a car. How do I know it's not going to fail? Right. Right, right. So that's the motivation. Look, if you're trying to, if you're trying to build something which has to be real, I mean, look, I, I we grew up doing ad tech. Right. It doesn't really matter if you show someone the wrong ad; they just don't click on it. But you can't put this thing in a car, and, it, and it's got to work. And and, and but, you have to know, you know how I much mean, data uh, do I need? How do I test it? Yeah. But but even with an ad tech, if you have access to a tool like this, you might end up with better models, right? Well, you get more conversions, and yeah, ad tech is very competitive. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, and and we work in search relevant. Search is hyper competitive, and you, know, you certainly know, if you're. What's interesting is, uh, in many ways, models are getting commoditized. So, I mean, uh, this is a way for you to evaluate models more systematically. That's the goal. When we started this, right? so, there were only maybe fifty open source pre-trained models. Now there are hundreds of them. I mean, hugging faces produced. I don't oh, mean, the, the embeddings, <laughs> embeddings on uh, some on NLP. You have to paginate like why? Wow. So, yes, yes. So the oh, goal here is to automate. Yeah, to to to, to get provide, and that's what I do. I do NLP. Yeah. So, and how do you evaluate an NLP tool? And, and unless you're building a classifier, like we did, you know, like a text classifier, evaluating it. There are yeah. 25 different metrics. They're all, you know, how do you develop something? Um, and, and of course, a lot of these pre-trained models, you do not have access to the training data. We have questions like, like theoretical questions we have. They're we, we, they're to me, they're like black boxes in the sense that, okay, they work, they work until they don't. <laughs> right. And, and look, this, this is exactly, exactly. And look, I try to focus on areas of problems where in industry where, you know, in finance, it's very clear you need to have this. Because yeah. you just can't train models. You have to be able to know that you know, your models you, are not you, overfit to the market. You also have regulators that may ask you questions if something goes wrong. 
right? Yeah, my goal is to sell this to the FDA so they use it <laughs> in medical. Look, look at all, look at all these problems. My goodness, look at what's going on in healthcare and these sepsis models and the things that were oh, produced yeah. by yeah. Epic. It's a mess. You know, that you release models into production and they totally fail. And this is very common that you'll train a model in a laboratory. You'll put it into the production environment and it totally fails. And, and I think we're just sort of scratching the surface of what it takes to make AI an engineering discipline, meaning that you have you understand what makes something reliable, what makes it robust. How do you evaluate it? You, you just can't do brute. You can't do everything by brute force. There has to be more clever things you can do. You have to you know, you can't test a bridge by building it and just driving cars over it and see if it, it falls down. I mean, that's what we used to do, right? Yeah. We'd build bridges, we'd put them up, the wind would blow and they would fall down. You have to have some theory which can tell you, look, if I build this thing, is it going to break? And, and I, at this point, we're just, we're just getting to the point now, things like, can I predict the test accuracy of a model without looking at test data? That's a critical thing. How, how do you, you know, you can't always do cross-validation. Cross-validation doesn't tell you, cross-validation can't really give you out-of-sample performance. Because you're still using your training data to evaluate it. Right. We, we are able to predict the test accuracy without looking at either without looking at the data or certainly without looking at test data. So we, I, we think it's going to be much, a much more robust predictor. And, and there are just, you know, lots of, you know, we can detect problems in layers. People, you know, when people think about models, they think about the models either overtrained or undertrained. Like, no, think about it layer by layer. Right. Certain layers are overtrained, certain layers are undertrained, and you can go in and adjust your model layer by layer to try to fix that. And we can tell you layer by layer which which layers you can't see that from test accuracy. You can't see which layers are overtrained and which ones are undertrained. You have to have a theory to tell you that. So this is the kind of thing where um, you know, the, the question is operationally, how do we turn this in? How do we get product market fit? You know, how do we build something that engineers can use and that they like and will make your life better? And the only way I know to do that is to give them, you know, talk to them. Yeah. <laughs> what are you doing? And, and I think the fine tuning is like, that's the big thing we're working on now. I've, like, I've been started really trying to think about how do we improve fine tuning? Um, it's something that I do when you're trying. Yeah, to yeah. Life. I mean, I think, I think uh, honestly, uh, I, I would say that uh, the bigger audience is the people who don't necessarily build models, but have to use models. Yeah, yeah. Right, because uh, the building of the models might be uh, a smaller community for one, and also uh, uh, it's an arms race that not a lot of people can can participate in, but a lot of people want to use these models. So that that if you can find a way to insert yourself into the people using models, right? So. Yes, I, I think, you know, think about it from an ML ops perspective. Yeah, exactly. You have to, this is a monitoring tool and you don't put a model in production unless it passes this sort of unit test yeah, yeah. to make my, sure my, the uh, alphas are not QA crazy. A validation with, right. with, 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 uh, with audit trails, right? So, I mean, I, I, when I work in industry, that is the hardest thing. Yeah. How do you know, it is just so hard to know if you put a model in production whether it's going to work, you don't. And, and experiments are expensive. A/B tests are expensive. I mean, if you're running a big company, you know, uh, we have clients like Walmart. That's not. It's not cheap to do an A/B experiment at Walmart scale. So you have to have some way of knowing, some confidence to know if you put this thing in production, it, it's at least going to have. It's not going to be completely bananas. Right. And that's it. That's where we're starting from. Right. And with that, uh, thank you, Charles. I will link to the. Uh... Uh, paper uh, and the Weight Watcher tool and to calculation consulting. Thank you. Hey, again. thanks. Thank you. I really appreciate it.